job a lot. <laughs> so uh, that's I'm, I'm going to go to I'm going to take my wife to Italy uh, for cool. three months, Ooh. a year summer. We might get there. Just do it. Yeah. We have a missionary in uh, uh, Rome with whom I'll get in contact, and hopefully he's got... I, I knew a guy that worked for the Vatican um, bureaucracy, priest. And uh, we haven't talked in a long time, but I might go visit him and see if I can get him to get me the special tour of the Vatican, which I'm sure he can do. Anyway. Um, who else did we have here? Uh, so we got Walker's. Oh, Kurt Vander A. Um, so we'll, we'll wait for uh, we'll wait for Miranda. Why are you taking this course? <laughs> you got nothing else to do. <laughs> Experience. Yeah. Yeah. Good timing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You'll be fine. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you have so graciously dealt with us, that you have written to us love letters written in blood and made certain by your death. Now be with us as we learn more about your word this night. Uh, that we may make use of it, set it upon our hearts and minds, and confess it faithfully in a world in such desperate need. All this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so uh, the vicar tells me you got as far as Paul's letters in the quick walk through the Bible. Okay, so we're on page four, about two-thirds of the way down of our outline. So Paul's letters are organized in two groups. You have the congregational letters. Hey, Kurt. How are you? Yeah, I know. It happens to me, too. I, you walk into church, and it's got to be good morning, but it's, it's 7 p.m. Yeah. So, so I don't forget, Kurt, we're going to move this class to Sunday morning, Okay. starting this Sunday. It'll meet in here, 945, 1045. Is that okay? Will that work? Okay, great. It's better for the, the children, and sure. it's actually better for the old people, I too. That <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know if that was, if this is a repeat of that. So it is. Yeah. Yeah, so they were finished this week. That We finished church and ministry this week with them. Okay. And, and so now we'll, we'll take over this room and just start it all over again. Yeah, I've, I've taught this class... What, uh, uh, probably 110 times in my career. Not exactly as it is here, but... So I've had a little experience. Two or three times a year for 40 years is a fair amount of experience. All right, so we, the, the Bible has Paul's letters divided up into two groups, congregational and pastoral. What we mean is he writes to congregations, he writes to specific clergy. Then the letters are organized by length, not by date of writing, not by any other criterion, uh, except to say the Bible will always put like 1st and 2nd Corinthians together, right? But other than that, it's about their size. So of the congregational letters, the longest is Romans, which, of course, is a letter to the Christians in Rome. He writes it before he ever gets there. He will later in his career, but he writes to the Romans. Uh, sight unseen. Uh, then you have 1st and 2nd Corinthians. They are not really 1st and 2nd Corinthians. They are 2nd and 4th Corinthians. We don't have 1st and 3rd. So there's a letter before 1st Corinthians and there's a letter after 1st Corinthians. We know this from internal evidence, right? Um, if we ran across the real 1st Corinthians, we'd be obligated, if it could be proven, to add it to the canon. 
is that likely to happen? Uh, no, it's not. Right. So we're stuck with First and Second Corinthians as they are. Um, in the old, in, in, when I was young, people would take First Corinthians, especially, as a great example of the way church ought to be. And I think it was people who didn't read it very carefully that thought this, because the most screwed up congregation in the New Testament is Corinth. It, it's horrible. Um, anyway, enough about that. Then you have Galatians, which is the longest of the single letters. Um, Galatians is very early. We, there's a debate whether Galatians or 1 Corinthians is the first of the New Testament texts. You know, we'll wait till we get to heaven. That'll get sorted out there. Galatians is Paul at his absolutely toasted best. He is ticked. He talks about people cutting off their private parts and all kinds of hot stuff like that. He is really mad. Well, why? Because the Galatians had bought the idea that the law still had to be kept even if he had Jesus. So they were certainly um, followers of, of the uh, Do uh, Doobie Brothers. They had the hit song, Jesus is Just All Right. Well, that's the way the Galatians thought about it. Jesus is just all right, but we have to be circumcised. And Paul goes volcanic on that one. Of course, he's a Jew, right? He knows the game. And it's fabulous reading. Um, Luther's most attractive commentary on the Bible is on Galatians. He calls Galatians his Katharina von Bora. In other words, his wife. That's her name is Catherine von Bora. It's f uh, just, and if you if you're going to read something by Luther that's a little extensive, it's two volumes. Read his Galatians commentary. It, it it just it causes you to weep. It's so beautiful and clear and uh, encouraging and uh, you know it, it's just fabulous stuff. Ephesians, Ephesus, of course, is now in Turkey. I will be there in uh, June, so I'm excited about that. I've never been before. Um, pleasure, pleasure and work. I'm taking a tour. Oh, okay. So I'm the uh, religious advisor, and I will fill in the St. Paul um, points as we go along. We're doing Athens, Corinth, um, um, Crete, uh, Mykonos, Ephesus, back to Lorium, and then north into what was Macedonia, but Thessalonica. Uh, we'll see um, the tomb of uh, Philip of Macedon. If you've never seen it, move heaven and earth and go. I've been there. Uh, go see that. Um, Epi not Epidaurus, sorry. Uh, I can't think of the name of the place off the top of my head. Anyway, so we'll be there a dozen days with a group and we're going to have a total blast. I have a whole bunch of people that, for whatever reason, like traveling with me. <laughs> it doesn't include my wife. She goes, but she doesn't like traveling with me, right? But the group, they, they're so much fun. I just love these people. And, and so we've got a bus full. It's 50 folks. Yeah. Uh, if you want to go, it's too late. We're all subscribed. Too bad. Uh, Philippians. Oh, sorry, I was going to say something about Ephesus. Ephesus is right on the coast of Turkey. Uh, it had the largest ancient temple. Now think of the Temple of Athena on the Acropolis in Athens. Then triple it. Wow. And so you can see that in Ephesus, paganism is a tough nut to crack. Paul goes there anyway. And he causes a riot and almost gets ripped limb from limb. It's all, it's all in the life of the Lutheran minister, right? Just get lip, ripped limb from limb. Um, and uh, so we'll actually see the, the, um, the town council. Come on in, join the club. Um, the town council met in the, um, in the um, amphitheater. And so the riot happened right in that amphitheater, and you can stand there where uh, the riot occurred. You walk up the Royal Way in Ephesus and, and go to that amphitheater. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Philippians is written to Philippi. Um, 
uh, which is uh, in Macedonia on the coast. Um, the Philippians, I think, were Paul's favorite congregation uh, because the letter to the Philippians is just full of gushing love. It's fabulous, right? They love each other uh, immensely. Uh, and, of course, it's also the, the book of joy. Rejoice, I say. And again, I say rejoice. We always read that as the epistle lesson, that third Sunday of Advent, which is um, the Sunday of Gaudite. Rejoice. Um, if you've got questions, by the way, you know, let me know. Colossians is also in modern-day Turkey. Uh, Colossi uh, uh, was a town. It would be uh, not too far from, from Ephesus, but in toward the interior um, more. Then you have the Thessalonian correspondence, First and Second Thessalonians, Thessalonica, the victory of the Thessalonians, or the victory of Thessaly is what it means, um, is um, farther west in Macedonia. It's a beautiful place, by the way. Most people don't know this. In the second century, Roman emperors summered in Thessalonica because the weather was nice, and it's right on the water, uh, and they built incredible buildings there. So you can see these buildings that the earthquakes have not yet toppled. Uh, in some cases, they're in pretty bad condition, though. Um, I spent about a week there, what, 12 years ago? Something like that. Anyway, beautiful place, fabulous. Um, then you have the pastoral letters. So remember we said they're congregational letters, they're pastoral letters. So here are the pastoral letters. You have First and Second Timothy. So those are Paul's letters to his protege, Timothy. He's apparently young. Remember, he, Paul says, don't let anyone despise you because of your youth. And all young clergy have that as a text at their ordination. <laughs> and then his letter to Titus. And, and they're giving, Paul's giving instructions to pastors on to how to function in their ministry. Uh, so... It, you ha as a layman, you have to read it backward, right? What do I owe my pastor if this is what Paul is saying pastors should be doing? Um, it also tells you what your pastor owes you. Um, you know, we have a high responsibility, and we stand before God and will answer to him for the content of what we preach. We will be judged for it. So do not take lightly what your pastor is doing. It's, it's delightful. I, I tell people, pay attention. I tell people it's the hardest, easiest job in the world. It's easiest because you're just letting God do what he says he'll do. It's the hardest because you will get resistance from now until you draw your last ragged breath. That's the way it goes. But it's, it's fun work, and I... I grieve for the fact that it is coming to an end. Philemon uh, is Paul's lovely letter, uh, Getting Onesimus Home. Uh, if you want to read a high-class bit of rhetoric where Paul is obviously going to get his way, if you want to get your way by what you write, you use Paul's letter to Philemon as the model. There's no doubt that Philemon forked over everything Paul wanted in that letter. It is masterful. Poor me, poor Paul. I'm a prisoner, and you owe me a lot, but I'm not going to demand anything from you, and so on and so forth. <laughs> some, of it, some of it really is a sort of passive aggression almost, you know, but it's a delightful read. Uh, and it's only a chapter. It's only like 22 verses or something like that, and it's, uh, it's delightful. Um, so those are the pastoral letters to Pastor Timothy, Pastor Titus, and Pastor Philemon. Oh, one other thing to be said, by the way. All, especially the congregational letters were, were required to be uh, circular. So in many places, Paul will say, and make sure you read the letter from, right? Like in uh, Colossians, he'll say, you know, and read the letter from Laodicea. Uh, but we don't have that letter. No. But the point is that these were to be circulated in the church. They weren't just for one congregation or even one city. 
and that's why they end up being spread throughout the ancient world like that. Um, the other thing you have to realize, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just keep going with the book, sorry. So then you have general letters. We don't know who they're to, and in some cases we don't know who they're from. The letter to the Hebrews is the first of those. Uh, the letter to the Hebrews is sublime. Um, the, the Greek in the letter to the Hebrews is right up there with the hardest and the best Greek in the New Testament. Whoever writes it is a masterful expert with Greek. It's qualities right up there with Luke, who writes Acts. In my Greek readings, when I run into Acts and when I run into Hebrews, I'm pulling my hair out because it's tough sledding. Um, we don't know who wrote it. Uh, at one time, the church thought it was Paul. It ain't Paul. Uh, there is a theory, and I like this theory, and there's very little evidence for it, which is another reason to like it, um, that one of the sons of Caiaphas, the high priest, is the author of the letter to the Hebrews. That's purely conjecture, but we know from church history that Caiaphas um, buries one of his live sons. I don't mean physically. He has a funeral for him. What's he done? We don't know, but we guess it's he's converted. Acts tells us a number of priests are converted. The other thing we know is that the, the priestly class, the Sadducees, were intensely Hellenistic. Right? We think of the other super Jews. Eh, eh, they're not. They play the Jewish game in public. They live as Greeks in private. And so that boy would have been taught high-class Attic Greek in his house. Uh, and they would have dressed like Greeks and so on. But as you read Hebrews really carefully, you, you find out that the person who writes it knows the Old Testament ritual like that. But interestingly, he also knows the contemporary ritual of the temple like that. So who's got a foot in both those worlds and has high-class Greek? A son of Caiaphas. Totally unprovable, but I think it's a cool theory. Ha-ha uh, and Caiaphas besides. <laughs> All right. Then you have James, which is written by a brother of Jesus, a blood brother of Jesus. He is one of Mary's children by uh, Joseph. He is among the brothers who say to Mary, Mother, do something about your son. He's a nutburger. He's going to get himself killed, right? And what does Jesus say? Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he points to his disciples sitting right there. So at the resurrection, he has this family meeting with his brothers who all went, oh, he is who he said he is, right? But Jesus redeems them and they become spokesmen for the church. He writes James. It is interesting, too, that neither James... Uh, nor Jude, who's also a blood brother of Jesus, will claim their blood brothership in the letters. They don't introduce themselves as brothers of Jesus. That's humility, right? The blood connection, they know, is not significant because they thought their brother was a nut burger, right? But, but Jesus redeems them. Um, then you have Peter's letters, first and second, uh, they're interesting in that Second Peter is a lot like Jude. Um, Second Peter um, is obviously written by a different secretary. The language of First Peter is a lot more highfalutin. Second Peter, not so much. Um, and of course, we know that all of these letters were written by secretaries. Paul will mention his from time to time. Um, so what they would have done is they would have written this in. Um, wax tablets in shorthand. They would have cleaned that up and then the secretary would have put it in fair hand in papyrus. Now, well, maybe it's the time to say this. The 
New Testament is a $20,000 item in modern terms. Written in papyrus, in fair hand. So you've paid a secretary. There's two books that actually have benefactors, Luke and Acts. Theophilus is the guy that's forked over for their production. And so he gets mentioned in the prologue in both Luke and Acts. Um, So the odd thing, too, by the way, is that the New Testament letters are without exception longer than any ancient letter. I mean, I shouldn't say it that way. Sorry. The average length of ancient letters extant. There's about 20,000 extant original letters from the period, 1st and 2nd century, like on either side of, of 1 B.C., Um, There's about 20,000 of them extant, and their average length is 164 words. Why? Because papyrus is big bucks, right? You're not wasting a single bit of that paper. And they would, in fact, clean it off and reuse it. It's called a palimpsest. And what we do every once in a while, we find a palimpsest and go, we're not really interested in the grocery list on this. But I bet there was something on it that's more important. And what do we do? We run it through electronic equipment, and it gives us the original text. If, if you're just starting co- none of you are. If we were just starting college, I would recommend to you ancient manuscripts because we're now able to unroll scrolls that we weren't able to unroll before. We run them through MRIs. And we're going to end up with plays, Greek plays we knew existed but had no text for. And many of them, of course, suffered because of fire. You unroll it, and it's, it's ruined, right? So they don't unroll them. They run them through MRIs. Correct. Right. Sure, we have that example with Corinthians, right? Because we know Paul refers to other letters in both 1st and 2nd Corinthians. If we found them, and they could be ascertained to be legitimate, but this would never happen, right? It would never happen. But theoretically, Lutherans think it's possible. Other church bodies deny the possibility of, of other books being added to the canon. Because... They have a kind of King James fetish with, if it's in the King James, you know, it's all good. But, I mean, God didn't send golden plates down to King Jim. Uh, and we'll talk more about that, too, yet today. So, theoretically, it is possible, sure. Um, then you have first, second, and third John. Uh, again, we don't know exactly who they're written to. There's lots of speculation, and there's some internal evidence, but... Um, they're so beautiful because John, um, I don't know how you describe John. John. Well, I'll use Augustine's illustration. John um, is the lamb uh, who uh, walks across the water in which the elephant drowns. In other words, simplicity with incredible depth. Right, so uh, John is the Dick and Jane Gospel. John are the Dick and Jane Epistles. But you get into them and you go, oh, that's deep. Um, First John especially follows what we would call kind of a circular pattern. We don't, you know, we're Westerners, we're Greek thinkers. He's an Easterner more. We think like this: beginning, end, boom, right? That's called history. We think this way. John writes 1 John like this. You know, and then the end, and you go, okay, how does that all hang together? And you're trying to go up that helix, which is which it, it broadens out, and figure how it all hangs together. It's really tough on us Westerners to read, uh, especially 1 John from that perspective. Um, after that, of course, Jude, written by the brother of the Lord. Um, just a single chapter, of course, not very long. Longer than Philemon, but still. 
But again, we don't know who they're written to. Then you have the book everybody wants to study, Revelation. Singular. Yes, singular. It's not revelations. It is an apocalypse, a single thing. The best way to think about Revelation is that it is a series of stained glass windows telling of the triumph of the church. You must read it with the understanding that it was written for readers in the first century A.D. It is not the battle plans for Armageddon in Jerusalem next year, right? It just ain't. And so I've taught it, I guess, about four times in my career, which is the absolute limit. I'll never do it again. And you start teaching it to lay people, and they go, oh, is that all it is? You know, they, they, of course, they're looking for the nuclear code or, you know, the Da Vinci code or what. No, that isn't what it's about. All right. Great book. Lovely. Full of beautiful songs of praise to God. Um, the pictures there are just arresting. Of course, there's no stained glass windows in the first century A.D., so the, the stained glass windows are in writing. It's fabulous stuff. Okay. Let me pause there. Questions about the New Testament? Apocalypse, Kurt. Oh, you're getting ahead of me. We'll get there. Hang with me. Oh, no, I'm fine. Thank you very much. So let's talk time of writing. The Bible it, it dates from about 1446, give or take a few years, B.C. to 96 A.D., give or take a few years. We know that the revelation was given to John in 96 on a Sabbath. We know that from the text. Uh, he was expelled from Ephesus because he was such a pain in the posterior by the emperor because he wouldn't shut up about Jesus. And he gets sent off to Patmos, which is an island off Asia Minor, and is stuck there. Not very long, actually. I think only a year or so. Um, 1446 is when uh, the Bible is probably started by Moses at the time of the Exodus. Uh, the Exodus occurs within a year or two of 1446. Uh, there's more to that dating than what I can say here and now, but I'm, I'm just giving you the parameters. Uh, John closes the New Testament probably, probably with the Revelation about 96. The Bible is written in primarily two languages, but really three. There's Aramaic in Daniel, the letters of the, uh, uh, of, uh, um, of the Persian king are written in Aramaic. The rest is in Hebrew in the Old Testament, with a few foreign words thrown in here and there. And then the Greek uh, is the New Testament. Um, Hebrew is a wonderful language. I'll just pass around a Hebrew Old Testament. Um, it's read um, uh, left to right instead of right to left. Did I get that right? No, the other way around, sorry. It's, it's, it's read the wrong way, whatever way that is. Uh, here, Kurt, you can have that. So it's also read back to front, right? So Genesis is in the back of the book, and you read that way, right? Uh, this is a book I can no longer read. This was my original Greek, Latin, interleaf New Testament. And um, with my eyes, uh, it's very frustrating. So. This is Greek? Yeah, that's Greek with, with Latin interleaved. So if you know one, you got the pony for the other. This, by the way, is a Greek Latin interleaf, and it's, it's Erasmus of Rotterdam's. Uh, 1516 uh, version of the New Testament. It's the first full New Testament available in Europe after the medieval period. Um, now, Hebrew is a wonderful language in the sense that it's quite guttural, so people sound like they're choking to death when they learn how to speak Hebrew. Um, it's all <laughs> like that, right? Um, this is Genesis 1. Bereshith bara Elohim et hashamayim et va et Haaretz. So when you go to Jerusalem and want to read the daily uh, newspaper, it's called Haaretz, the world. Right? Yeah. Uh, ha is the, Eretz is world. Um, they tend to squish words together. They have prefixes and suffixes. 
and if you're good at Greek, you're usually lousy at Hebrew or vice versa. I was lousy at Hebrew. It, it's tough sledding. Um, all right. New Testament is in Greek. Um, Greek is a wonderful language because it is so deadly clear. One illustration of that is Woodrow Wilson, who was the president at Princeton before he became president of the United States, wrote his presidential notes in Attic Greek. When asked why he did that, people thought it was, oh, well, so no one else could read them. Well, no. It was simply because Wilson said, when I go back 15 years from now, and you get to do that, of course, but 15 years from now and read my notes to write my memoirs, I will know exactly what I had said. In English, not so much. So this is why no politician of a modern era would ever agree to speak Greek because they would say unmistakable things and that would get them into all kinds of trouble. (laughs) This, of course, is the language of our friends Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and the list goes on. You know, it's the philosophical language. It deals with conceptualizations rather well. Hebrew deals with natural things rather well. Why? Because there's no movies. What do they do? They sit in the door of their home and watch the grasshoppers. Hebrew has four different words for a grasshopper. We have three probably, right? Uh, uh, Katytid, um, locust, grasshopper, I I don't know after that. They had four. Um, This is the first verse of St. John's Gospel. NRK, ein halagos, kai halagos, ein prostanteon, kai theos, ein halagos. So, in the beginning was the word. So, we get our English word logic. Anything that's word-based like theology, right? We got theos or theon here, theos here. Theology, a logy is the study of something in words generally, and theology is the study of God. So um, there's all kinds of cognates in Greek, uh, not as many as there are, of course, in Latin, but, but there's still plenty of cognates for English in the Greek language. Um, Greek has better verbs by far than English. Uh, They're much clearer, uh, and that's occasionally theologically significant. This is one of the reasons they torture your pastors by sending them to seminary and teaching them Greek. Sorry, Ross. But that's the way it is. All right, let me pause there. Questions about the language of the Bible. Okay, let's rock and roll. Um, Just want to say a few things about Bible translations. Um, The first quasi-systematic translation, of course, is into Latin, when people of the ancient world no longer spoke Greek fluently enough to read the Greek New Testament. And so Jerome takes the bits and pieces of the Latin translations floating around the ancient world and puts it together in a kind of systematic way Um, His Greek isn't all that good, so he occasionally goofs. Um, One of his big goofs, which has huge impact later, is he translates the word that means repent with the Latin poinitentiam agite, which means, or which gets sort of understood as, do penance. Whereas the Greek word for repentance means this, to be turned around completely in mind. It's not a doing, it's a way of being, right? And so you can see the huge problems that our dear friend Jerome uh, foists on uh, Christianity. Dates, Dates from about the fourth century. And he does it in Jerusalem. He's living in Jerusalem, actually. Um, Then you have the next... What would you say? Um, scholarly, a uh, high quality, consistent translation into a into a, um, a common language is good old Martin Luther's Die Heilige Schrift, um, 
it's still absolutely the gold standard in German. Uh, it's been updated for German language change, of course, um, but it, it is an absolute home run. He, um, he translates the New Testament in about nine months, um, and his goal, as he says, uh, is uh, to, to let the Germans sing. Uh, in other words, he wants the Bible on their hearts and minds. And so he translates it in a way that's friendly to the average person. So we have, you know, uh, Hail Mary, thou full of grace. And Luther translates that greeting in a way that's much more, hello, young woman. Oh, how nice. That's very friendly, right? And so, so this is Luther. Um, and he finishes that work in... 1532, when the Old Testament is finished. Um, he, uh, by the way, he teaches himself German in his spare, or uh, I should say Hebrew in his spare time. No dictionaries, no grammars. He teaches himself. How long did it take? Not long. For the whole Bible? Oh, so he, of course, he does the New Testament in nine months, yeah. right? They, they put him in hiding to keep his head attached to his body. Sorry. He's got nothing else to do, right? And then, uh, then he escapes, hiding, and uh, goes back to Wittenberg. And I'm not sure when he started actually working on the Old Testament, but it's done, the whole thing is done and in print 10 years after he started with the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah exactly. Wow. Yeah, so you have it in German in 1532. And Luther is the translator. Questions about Luther's work? Oh, the other interesting thing is there are sections of the KJV that are just cribbed from Luther, where they take the German and translate it into 1711 English. And all that is is it tells us that those translators, who, of course, knew German, uh, had a high respect for the quality of Luther's translation. So it did not get dropped out of heaven on golden plates. Uh, of course, the gold standard for English translations remains the King James Version. If your English is powerful and you know words, keep reading it. It's great. Uh, if, um, if you don't have that capacity, excuse me, then uh, you probably need to find a better translation. I don't mean better in the sense that it's better quality than the KJV, but just simply that you'll understand it, right? So my favorite example of this is Paul in Galatians will say in King James Version English, for ye have heard of my conversation in time past. So here, what does conversation mean? Yeah, uh, uh, how, how I talked, perhaps, right? Wrong, sorry. In 1711, it means how I conducted my life. So what he means here is, you have heard of how I conducted my life in the past. The average English reader in 2024 doesn't know that, right? So um, I love the Psalms. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O Lord. <gasps> they just pass out from that. Well, you don't know what a heart is. We don't call streams water brooks. You know, all those things are, are difficult for the English reader. So I don't recommend the KJV to anybody except people who have degrees in Middle English or something like that. I do rec... Oh, here's ESV. Uh, that's, the, that's kind of our standard translation. There's no law about translations. I mean, you're looking for something that's good quality and speaks your English. Revised Standard Version dates from the middle of the 20th century in the 50s. Um, it has problems, especially in the Old Testament, where the presumption of the translators was that there were no prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament. Brother! <laughs> they couldn't possibly have read the New Testament, right? Because the New Testament presumes that the Old Testament is about the coming of the Christ, right? Right? So I don't recommend the RSV, although it was my translation probably from the time I was about 13 till I was maybe 20. Somebody stole it. Can you imagine stealing a Bible? <laughs> that was the end of that. So I moved on to the NIV. 
So the New International Version from Zondervan Publishers. Um, it's a pretty good marriage of faithfulness to the original, clarity in English. Right? So you're on a spectrum. You know, here's the original language. Um, so for example, Greek is disinterested in word order because it's inflected, highly inflected. So word order gives sort of language feel, but it's not meaning. It doesn't matter what order you put the words in, it still means the same thing. Um, and so as you read Greek, if I read it literally, I sound like Yoda. <laughs> Jedi Knight I am, right? <laughs> now that flies terrible with the English speaker. So what we're doing often is moving this way toward understandability so that, so that Paul speaks English instead of Jedi Knight, right? Um, and, and so the New International Version was not a bad uh, solution to that. Uh, it became impaired when Zondervan made it uh, gender um, screwed up. <laughs> I don't know how to put it any differently. Where, where even God's uh, personal uh, pronouns were uh, degendered. Yeah, and uh, so at that time we were producing a hymn book, and of course you need a Bible to go with it. And we went to Zondervan and said, well, we'd like to continue to use the old NIV. And they went, you're welcome to do that, but we'll sue you for everything you were, you're worth if you do. We hold the copyright to this baby and we're changing it. And we went, that'll be just fine. We'll move on to another translation, right? And we ended up with the English Standard Version. In the meantime, you've also got the um, New American Standard Bible. It tends to be over here toward Greek original or Hebrew original. Um, it, it, it's, it's going to use modern English, but the word order in many cases is going to reflect the original much more closely. It's great for verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, but if you sat down again and read Galatians in the New, New American Standard Bible from, from one end to the other, again, you'd start to sound like like Yoda. I recommend to people, uh, especially our Lutheran Study Bible, for which I was an editor and a writer of notes. Uh, there are no royalties accruing, so I'm in the slightest bit embarrassed to recommend it to you. Um, it's available from Concordia Publishing House. If you keep an eye out on their website, they have sales from time to time. And you can get one for like 30 bucks or something like that. It's the first English, uh, I'm sorry, it is the first English Bible with Lutheran notes from end to end. And it is the first Lutheran Bible with notes since the 17th century. And of course, the translation is English Standard Version. Accurate, readable, in other words, it speaks our English. Um, and the Lutheran Study Bible then gives you great timelines, introductions, there's prayers in it, um, there's a way to uh, sorts out, especially cultural tr you know, difficulties where you're going, wait a minute, God did what? How does that work? And then when you know what the cultural meaning is, and you go, oh, I get it, we'll run into those things in this class and we'll have some fun with them. Crossways Publishers. And we were involved in the translation. I think Robert David Preuss was on the committee and one other of our theologians. They didn't have a lot of influence, but it's still really good. It's still really good. So it's not a Lutheran translation. There's no such thing, right? There's only a translation that properly reflects the original. We're good with that. Yeah, superb notes, introductions, maps, timelines, etc. All right, questions about translations. You are altogether too pious. <laughs> I've taught this class a lot of years, and they go—they're very funny. I, I'll teach one class, and they've got a zillion questions. The next time I teach it, everyone goes, "No, I'm good with that. Let's just keep going." <laughs> So, all right, don't, don't hesitate to weigh in, please. I grew up with King James. Yeah, I love him. Yeah. And then I went to, uh, because it is old, a lot of old English, 
Yeah. Yeah. I recommend it. Well, so I'll, I'll confess faithfully. I hope we don't do any more changes to Bible translations. You know, I'm 65 and I've had four Bible translations and two different catechism versions. This is one big mess, especially for me, right? If I want to quote a passage, I've gotten to the point where I don't care anymore. I realize I am in some cases eliding NIV, ESV, and KJV all in one quotation. Now, it's still a faithful quotation, but it's made up of a whole bunch of different translations. It's not good for memory to have all of those translations floating around in your brain. And the older you get, the worse it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If there's something flabbergasting, it's helpful. I mean, the meaning is usually, uh, the semantic domain is like a circle, right? And so sometimes the meaning is being sorted out, you know, from every angle, and you figure out what the semantic domain is by looking at the various ways it can be translated. In a pinch, you call your pastor and say, hey, what's this mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, people who do that. Uh, all right. So I want to talk about the the, the Bible's um, provenance. In other words, how does it come to be? The Bible teaches, and we believe that it was written by inspiration. By inspiration, we're simply using what Paul says to, in Second Timothy to Timothy, that all Scripture is breathed out by God. The verb is breathed out by God is a single word in, Hebrew, in Greek. It's all one thing, right? Uh, we have the English word pneumonia. What is it? Disease of the breath, right? Can't breathe. Uh, and that's the word for spirit, pneuma. So breathed out is, by God is theopneustos. Theo, God, noistos, breath. 